Welcome to the Voices of Uprising, the Crossroads of Whiteness and Masculinities. My name is Andrew Ives. I use he, him, his pronouns. I work at UWL's Student Life Office, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's discussion. The Voices of Uprising series started in the summer of 2020. This is the second installment of the Voices of Uprising series. Before we get started, I'd like to read UWL's land recognition statement. We would like to recognize that the University of Wisconsin La Crosse occupies the land of the Ho Chunk people. Please take a moment to celebrate and honor this ancestral Ho Chunk land and the sacred lands of all Indigenous peoples. Thank you. So why are we here? The Voices of Uprising, the Crossroads of Whiteness and Masculinities, hope to challenge white supremacy on our campuses and in our communities, to try to make sense of and disrupt the continued wave of white men's violence and resistance in this country, to make the connection between white supremacy and higher education, and to inspire white men, students, faculty, staff, and administrators to become active agents of change. Before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to recognize that we all identify as white on the, uh, in this group. We hope to highlight our own experiences of being complicit with white supremacy and male supremacy, as well as ways we confront and disrupt systems of oppression. Our primary audience is other white faculty, staff, and students, and the UWL community to engage in this discussion. The decision to comprise this panel entirely of white people is made purposefully and in conversation with the Voices of Uprising Committee. We all believe that there is a need for spaces in which white people talk primarily to other white people about power, privilege, and oppression. There is also an, a very important need to not further marginalize BIPOC individuals by asking them to do the educating of whites. This Voices of Uprising panel is such a space that aims for white educators to engage with other white students, staff, faculty, and administrators to raise their awareness, explore their privilege and power, and begin to engage more actively in discussions and initiatives around diversity equity and inclusion. So now we'll start with our panelists and panelists, I'm gonna ask that you share your name, pronouns, your area of study and why you're here today. And we'll start with Dr. LaPlante. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Christina LaPlante. I use she, her pronouns and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration here at UW La Crosse. Uh, and I think the main reason I've gotten interested in these type of discussions is really a function of the type of research that I do. I do a lot of research on identity and gender stereotypes and why people engage in these processes and why prejudice is such a huge factor in not only how we assess other groups, but how we make political decisions as well. And I think that one of the strongest ways that we can combat prejudice and bias and um, all those type of things is by having conversations just like these. So I'm very happy to be here this evening. Dr. Vianden. Thanks, Andrew. Yorick Vianden, he, him, his pronouns, professor of student affairs administration in higher education here at UWL. Been here since 2010. Um, my research has kind of always, or at least since my dissertation, involved men and masculinities. And maybe unbeknownst to me at the time, I, I was also studying white men. And that sort of thread has continued uh, throughout um, most of my time as a faculty member. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm here today and glad to be here. Thanks. And Dr. McKelly. Thanks, Andrew. My name is Ryan McKelly. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology at UWL. This is my 
13th year at UWL, but I think I've been doing stuff with minimum entities since I started graduate school. So it's been about 17 years. I'm also a licensed psychologist. So in addition to studying this, and some of my research is aligns a, a bit with Dr. Viandin's, but um, I've looked at men in non-traditional roles, looking at straight white men's resistance to seeing themselves as uh, having a role in social justice, men's emotional expression, fatherhood. Um, but I think I've always been interested on, uh, it, on some level. And it really got interesting to me uh, when I started doing clinical work, uh, both with male identified clients uh, as individuals, but then also in men's therapy groups. Um, and it probably really wasn't until, I, I always say I'm a slow learner, probably wasn't until I was working in higher education that I started learning about white identity, my own white identity. Um, and that was because of the great work that happens here at the institution from staff and then students in classrooms. So I'm honored to be here and, and glad to be able to contribute. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So we have this relatively organized as we're going to look at like, we're really going to look at the larger picture and start going and, and drilling down a little bit as we go from there. So to, to maybe give us the larger picture, Dr. LaPlante is going to start um, and then we'll move in to looking, uh, Dr. Viandin is going to narrow us down a little bit further to potentially higher education. And then um, Dr. McKelly is going to talk a little bit more about the individual. After that, we'll then uh, I'll have some questions for our panelists as well. So Dr. LaPlante. Thank you. Uh, so first, I'd like to begin by discussing this intersection of whiteness and masculinities. And why is it that the collision of these two things seem to increasingly result in violence and sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, just extremism broadly. And I think over the last few years, there's been a really heightened focus on the radicalization of young white men in America. And it's left politicians, the media, pundits, all scratching their heads asking, why is there such a resurgence in white supremacy today? Uh, why is white nationalism becoming increasingly popular among young white men? And why are young white men uh, more likely than any other ethnic group in this country to commit a mass shooting? And while all of these are unfortunately empirically true, we're never really given a very good answer besides, well, white men don't want to acknowledge their privilege, so they act out. Or white men can't reconcile with the fact that their behavior is toxic. Um, and, you know, I, I think that these are highly problematic explanations of the behavior, both for society and for white men, uh, because it doesn't really ad address the issue uh, or the root of the cause. And if we don't understand the root of these ideologies, what drives men, particularly young white men, to ideational white supremacy, or worse, we dismiss these behaviors as misguided entitlement, we really can't fix the problem um, because we haven't adequately understood the cause. Um, that's kind of what I want to focus on on the brief amount of time that I have to speak this evening. Uh, what are some of these root causes that predominantly drive young white men towards extremism, specifically in the vein of white supremacy, white nationalism, and an infatuation with conspiracy theories? How can we understand this and what can we do collectively to address this issue? Um, and I always like to begin with the uh, you know, a history or historical backdrop uh, of the problem as, uh, as a political scientist and a history major long ago, um, I think it's extraordinarily important to recognize that young white men in particular did not begin supporting white supremacy because of Donald Trump's coded political messaging during his tenure as president. Young white men did not begin embracing white supremacy in the aftermath of Barack Obama's historic presidential victory because it was a signal of you know a loss of white power did those things contribute to the increase of white nationalism white supremacy of course but unfortunately we have to recognize these ideas and these sentiments have been with us for a very long time they simply became a lot louder and a lot angrier i think a lot of that has to deal with the convenience and the anonymity of the internet and that's something that i'm going to get into uh, in a little bit later. Uh, but what I want to focus on are these series of events that have led young white men to become more vulnerable to extremism, to identify those critical points in which conversion 
if you could call it, uh, occurs, um, along with those sequential processes that ultimately lead to very extreme social positions and in some cases, violence. And I really wanna start with the foundational text of the modern men's rights movement, The Myth of Male Power by Warren Farrell. And in his book, uh, Farrell reminds us that second wave feminism is primarily concerned with fighting against the patriarchy, right? It's, um, it's about fighting against those patriarchal power structures um, that relegated women to domestic and traditional gender roles and you know this concept broadly of domestic servitude perpetuated by the patriarchy um, and this is where a lot of young white men began dipping their toes in extremism is through the MRA movement the men's rights activism movement um, and there's a lot of really critical points here that I want to break down um, Farrell argues that this feminist narrative that men have all the power is fundamentally flawed um, and through, he argues this through his idea of what he calls male disposability, um, that essentially men are just as, if not more, oppressed than women are. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what this concept of male disposability is, because I think it's extraordinarily relatable for a lot of young white men who um, kind of get hooked, um, drawn into uh, the path of radicalization. So male disposability is essentially this idea that society values the lives of women more so than the lives of men. Men are seen as expendable for the purpose of, purposes of providing for or protecting women. And when you have these conversations with people who believe you know, in, in these sort of things that society devalues the lives of men at the expense of overvaluing the lives of women, there is no shortage of statistics or empirical evidence that they can throw at you. 78% um, of suicides are men. 93% of murder victims are men. 98% of military casualties are men. 92% of workplace fatalities are men. Those are very horrific and scary statistics. And obviously the immediate argument that is generally made against MRAs or the men's rights movement um, is that for most of human history, right, it's been um, men who have served as heads of state. They've consistently and overwhelmingly served in parliaments and legislatures, and men have historically served in these high-ranking positions of power, and those are the institutions that are perpetuating gender differences and class differences and gender imbalances. Um, and that's kind of a, you know, that's its own specific conversation, talking about the lack of class consciousness that really perpetuates, you know, these ideas in the first place. But I think it is absolutely worth noting that um, these men's rights activists are certainly onto something here. I think it is undeniable uh, that there are very different societal expectations for how we treat women, how we treat men, our expectations of women, our expectations of men, and how we expect men and women's social spaces to function. You know, we live in a culture where it's totally acceptable or desirable, maybe even perceived as expected, that we compliment women on their appearance. We open doors for them. We help them fix their flat tires on the side of the road when they're, you know, stranded. Um, and, you know, feminists will often refer to this behavior as misogynistic because it's infantilizing and it suggests that women cannot do these things for themselves. But I think what's really important here and something that's been significantly overlooked is what the flip side of that coin looks like. Society has a far more hands-off approach when it comes to men and our expectations of men and how we treat men. Um, in public spaces, our society promotes the visibility of women and the invisibility of men. Women don't feel obligated to compliment men on their appearances or their looks. And there's no social norm of women going out of their way to help or even interact with men. In fact, it's the opposite. The most pervasive social norm of how women ought to interact with men is that they should be afraid of them, that they're dangerous. If you're walking home late at night by yourself and a man is following you, you should feel afraid. Even if we remove women completely from the equation for a moment, we know that there are drastic differences between male and female social groups. Women tend to be more expressive with their emotions. They're more nurturing and more compassionate. Um, and in some male social groups, you know, those kind of things might be less acceptable, being emotionally vulnerable, seeking attention, uh, you know, desiring affection. 
uh, these are generally perceived as socially unacceptable, um, particularly of a, a male seeking these type of things in a, in a male space. And I think when you couple that, this feeling of invisibility, this automatic assumption that you're dangerous, together with the rise of feminism, redefining traditional gender roles, and abandoning this masculine paradigm of men serving as the provider, as the protector, men have increasingly found themselves in environments where their purpose as men is completely ambiguous, or worse, they see no purpose at all. So my point, it's not surprising that we see more men advocating for an equivalent to feminism that liberates men from their oppressive gender role. And I think as feminists become more critical of masculinity, as pop culture becomes more demanding of male accountability through you know, the Me Too movement or the popularization of terms like mansplaining, toxic masculinity, manspreading, right? You, you end up with a lot of men feeling disempowered and shamed and confused and lost. So that's the historical backdrop. Enter the role of anonymous social spaces on the internet, and you have the perfect recipe uh, for mass radicalization among a traditionally privileged group of individuals who suddenly feel massively disempowered and seeking purpose. You know, there's a common thread, I think, among young white men who ascribe to the ideologies of the alt-right, who perhaps might identify as involuntary celibates or incels, men's rights activists, red pillars, there's a thousand different names and subgroups, um, you know, or maybe they find a specific allure or calling from QAnon conspiracy theories, because altogether they can agree that there is this massive systemic force moving against them, often argued to be spearheaded by feminists or social justice warriors or the deep state. You can see how we begin small and then we expand uh, to system level political conspiracy theories. Um, the point that all of these groups are intentionally seeking to disenfranchise and disempower uh, white men. And all of this really is just culminating in a crisis of male identity where the sacrificial role of men is no longer hailed as desirable. It's not necessary anymore. And feminism is the easiest target because feminism has incrementally reshaped gender roles and sexuality and has made some men feel displaced. So it's, you know, the archetype of this traditional male masculinity as the protector being rebranded as toxic, outdated. It's left many men wondering, what is the new archetype of male masculinity in the 21st century? What is it being replaced with? What am I left to emulate? And unfortunately, there is no answer to that. And to some extent, one could argue that the men's rights movement could very clearly address that, that need. Um, but instead of seeking empowerment and a solution to these problems, um, you know, the MRA movement, which I think, is, again, is so critical because I, I, I think it's where a lot of people are first introduced to these concepts. You know, it, the MRA movement has kind of taken a different approach that blames women for men's problems, just as second wave feminism blamed men for women's problems. And it's something I refer to as this whiplash activism. You have all of this infighting, all of this, um, you know, these various groups becoming more extreme because they're blaming each other as opposed to looking upwards towards political elites that are the institutions that perpetuate these differences and inequalities in the first place. Um, to sum up my points, I will rely on what Natalie Wynn, otherwise known as ContraPoints on her YouTube channel, has said regarding her diagnosis of young white male radicalization. Um, and I agree with her that the primary reasons that we see more young white men radicalizing to the extreme is because the group perceives a lack of purpose that puts them in search of a struggle. And that is fundamentally different from the perception of a struggle that facilitates a purpose. And again, when you couple this lack of purpose, an overwhelming sense of loneliness, a lack of positive identity, you become extremely vulnerable to extremism and ideologies and actions that promote violence against others as a method of making yourself seen in an environment and society that has otherwise treated your entire existence as expendable and invisible. Um, and so to close, I think the best thing that we can do as a society to combat white supremacy um, and to generate a new paradigm of 
you know, masculinity, white masculinity in the 21st century is to first, you know, be more cognizant of the political and class structures that intentionally disenfranchise people. And second, to promote um, positive models of white masculinity that give white men purpose in a space that also asserts progressive roles for women and people of color and the LGBTQ plus community and all peoples who have historically been disenfranchised. Thank you so much, Christina. Your? Thanks, Andrew. And thanks, um, Dr. LaPlante, Christina, for um, starting us off. It's really difficult to try to figure out how to say what's going on with white men who are college students, faculty, administrators, um, and staff in the context of their engagement with issues of diversity, social justice, inclusion, or equity. But I'm going to I'm going to try to do that anyway. Um, and. I had to sort of think about how I got involved here at UWL in this work. And it was actually Dr. McKelly, Ryan and I, along with Dr. Svoboda, my colleague in SAA, who started a research project in 2013 with this very basic question of where are all the white men? And when we said where, we meant um, their sort of continued and perennial absence from conversations, discussions, um, training, uh, education, coursework around issues of DEI. That's basically what we what we started this project with. Ended up calling it the Straight White College Men Project. This is where the shameless plug comes in. The Straight White College Men Project, which ended up doing focus group research at about 13 institutions around the country with 180 college students. Um, and that ended up in this in this book that I published early in 2020. Um, and I, I would love for people to read it because nobody is, uh, or very few people are. Um, but, but I think that might be a finding in and of itself when, when you're sort of talking about um, this topic. So getting into this topic a little bit more, I would like to start by sharing some statistics. And we're also starting with, with history like Dr. LaPlante did, um, to talk about the disparities that exist among white students and educators and BIPOC students and educators in the United States. So to, to spend not a ton of time on the history, but the history of higher education is primarily a history of exclusion, right? It excludes everyone starting in the 1600s, who is not white, a man, or a Christian, and does not include folks that are at least, that at least have one minoritized or multiple minoritized identities until sometimes hundreds or a couple of hundreds, year, a hundred years later. Uh, that's, the, that's the jumping off point for higher education in the United States, and I think it's an important one to sort of think about. Um, we can clearly then also still have heated debates today whether education has become this great equalizer or great equity producer um, for Americans in, in our current society. Uh, I would argue that it hasn't, um, many folks might disagree. Um, to think about sort of today's primary and secondary education context, um, there, there are several inequities that we can notice. And, you know, as we think about the pipeline from secondary, from primary ed to secondary to higher ed, we have to take these inequities into consideration. So we have wide achievement gaps between white students and specifically black and brown students. Uh, and unfortunately, Wisconsin is a leader uh, in the country of this, of this uh, disparate achievement. Um, we have disparate funding or underfunding of schools and equitable, inequitable per student expenditures. We have continued segregation and isolation of white students um, away from their BIPOC peers. Actually, we are more segregated now than we were in the mid eighties in, in our schooling, um, secondary and primary. Uh, and we continue to have disparate uh, higher, um, high school graduation rates of white students um, and students of color. When we, when we sort of switch to higher ed, we, we see that the overall college student population by race 
in 2017 was about 60%, 61% white, 18% Latinx, 12% African American, 6% Asian American or Pacific Islander, 2% one or more races, and less than 1% Native American or Alaska Native. So the college enrollment uh, rates are similar to the overall population rates by, by race and ethnicity. At a place like UWL, we don't notice that because predominantly white institutions always have a disproportionate enrollment of folks uh, of color. Um, when we look at the faculty, um, full-time college faculty in 2018, 53% white men, 35% white women, 7% Asian Pacific Islander men, 5% Asian Pacific Islander women, and 3% each of black men, black women, Latino men, Latina women, and uh, about 1% made up by faculty of Native American or Alaska Native descent. You also see, and we all know this, um, and folks at our institution and others know, know, know this as well, that we have vast underrepresentation of faculty of color among the ranks of tenured and promoted faculty, as well as vast underrepresentation of staff of color among top academic and administrative leadership positions, specifically again at predominantly white institutions. And then finally, sort of the, the, the pinnacle of, of administration in higher education, the presidency. Uh, last year of the top 25 institutions ranked by US News and World Report, one of those presidents was a Latinx person and five were women. So you, you, you see this vast overrepresentation of whites and white men specifically uh, in education. And you, you see this in all aspects um, of society, by the way. Um, and this whiteness has become and has been for a while normative, automatic, or even sort of unconscious, right? It, that, that means that we as white people don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about how what happens in the US or on our campuses may be driven by white norms, white decision-making, white behaviors or, or white actions. Um, and you see this kind of in the work of, of very well-known sociologists like Joe Fagan or Eduardo Bonilla Silva who, who discuss these concepts like white racial frame or white habitus in, in which our decision-making and the way that we look at the world becomes automatic um, by the way that we've been socialized and inculcated and raised as white people in, in a very racialized uh, system like the United States. And so when we think about this resistance of white men that Christina has begun to talk about, um, despite this evidence that we see that, that um, continues sort of to, to put white men in favorable position, um, we as, as white men, especially on college campuses, whether it's students, faculty, staff, or administrators, continue to often loudly resist these efforts, uh, like trying to make equitable recruitment or retention decisions, or exploring power, privilege, or oppression in classrooms or in discussions outside of class, or spending more resources on diversity education and training. Um, this resistance is sometimes subtle, but it is ongoing and persistent, and it has been incessant for decades. Uh, and, and we don't, as, as white faculty and staff or students, don't, don't often think about sort of the ways in which we um, quietly but incessantly protest, and I think that's important. So when we resist these kinds of efforts, in essence, we do three things. One, we protect and perpetuate normative whiteness and patriarchy, whether we think we're doing that or not. Two, we model behavior that continues to condone and recreate oppression of our students and colleagues who are already disadvantaged. And three, we say, and in no uncertain terms, that we just simply don't care enough about these inequities that we all know exist to finally do something about them. Um, we have often talked about sort of who should end oppression. So 
ending a problem like racism or any other form of oppression, and Christina mentioned several, is not the responsibility of the person who's the victim of that oppression, right? But the person who created it. And as white people, and this was one of the calls sort of to think about for us today here on this panel, as white people and white men specifically, we are directly complicit in creating, developing, and maintaining these kinds of conditions under which oppression continues, unfortunately, to thrive. Um, I think one of the reasons, and this sort of gets into the explanation of what's going on, I think what we have to do is to stop viewing education or sort of the inside our society in general as this zero sum game. So when, when, when people of color make gains, either in education, in politics, in wealth, in health, they don't do that at the expense of white people, right? So equity, which is what we're always talking about and, and folks don't always uh, under, understand, and it is a difficult concept. Equity is not about lifting people up beyond one another. It's the lifting of those who have not had to the same kind of level of those who have had, right? And in that kind of system, everyone benefits, not, not just the few. And I think that's important to sort of um, inspire and challenge white men to continue to think about. Um, and despite of all the stuff that we hear about, we should stop thinking about white privilege or we should stop interrogating white supremacy or we should stop studying uh, or, or, or training uh, diversity. Um, we, we need to continue to engage more white men specifically in these kinds of conversations because they do want to talk about them. They just not all have sort of found their way into this topic yet. Um, but but they are not uh, they are they are not uh, unable to have these kinds of conversations and these conversations can happen in uh, classrooms in lunch rooms in meeting rooms in locker rooms in living rooms in kitchens they can happen anywhere uh, the main thing is that we have them continue to have them and engage um, more people in them so that's sort of where I would end my introduction. Your Dr. McKelly. Thanks to Dr. Zaplant and Fiondin for, for setting that up. I'm, I'm going to come back to that word threat in a moment. Um, one thing I, I also want to kind of call out maybe before I start talking about, about things is uh, a cultural issue we have. It's not just whiteness, but it's, it's part of, I think, Western philosophy, uh, certainly in the United States. We really struggle to look at uh, things dialectically. We struggle with the both and, and so oftentimes it's, it, you know, we, we default to this either or, this black or white, right? This zero sum, zero or one. Um, and I'm gonna ask, ask you all to kind of try to hold both and in at the same time. Uh, because one, one of the problems with talking about masculinities on the intrapersonal level, like on the individual level versus some of the system stuff that we're covered, um, is that you know, sometimes people think like, maybe we're trying to excuse some of these behaviors and that's not certainly what I'm gonna try to do here. And so I want you to hold in, at the same time, somebody can be experiencing power and privilege. They can also be experiencing um, struggle. I think Dr. LaPlante made that clear too about you know, men looking for a, you know, a, a new source of inspiration uh, through some of these MRA channels and, and, and other opportunities. So I wanna talk a little bit about, maybe I'll start with the brain. Um, with that threat word, here I go. I said, uh, we won't dichotomize, but I'm going to dichotomize the brain. Um, you know, some have argued, some neuroscience have argued that uh, you know, we have fundamentally two major tasks as humans as, as we kind of scan our social world. Uh, we, we have our threat brain and our thrive brain. And when we're in thrive brain, uh, that's when we feel connected to other people. That's when we feel compassion and love and connection, all those things. Uh, that's when we describe all the, all the wonderful feelings. And that's when we as humans are operating optimally, you know, when we're at our best. Uh, and then there's the threat brain, that survival piece. Uh, when we experience threat as individuals, uh, and they've, they've mapped it in an active brain, uh, that part of us that gets kind of riled up emotionally actually shuts down a lot of that rational decision making and our ability to plan. And sometimes people end up engaging in these automatic uh, or what feels to be automatic behaviors that have been kind of built in these systems that we're talking about. Uh, so I want you to, so I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about that, that what happens when you have a, a vulnerable, I'll say emotionally vulnerable male 
uh, who feels under threat. And a lot of these systems are playing off of that vulnerability. Uh, and then they're uh, and then they kind of tune, fine tune that threat response by othering groups, whether they're othering them by race, ethnicity, or gender, or whatever it might be. Uh, and so it's it's a it's a setup uh, for some you know pretty egregious behaviors. Um, Christina had mentioned you know toxic masculinity. I, I I haven't found that to be a very helpful term, and, you know, as she pointed out. Um, because it has been weaponized by uh, the media, by politicians, and it often shuts down conversation. This last year, I've been working with the other three R's when I talk about masculinity and the, and the harmful side of it. Uh, we're looking at rigidity, uh, so rigid masculinity, um, restrictive masculinity, and reactive masculinity. And so looking at the behaviors that kind of fall under uh, those three R's, and they often, often work together. So I, I've been thinking about this, you know, trying to explain some of the, you know, some of the, her, you know, extreme horrific behaviors we've seen uh, men perpetrate, you know, and take a pick, whether it's been the last two weeks or two months ago, right? Uh, it, it seems to keep happening. Uh, in some ways, we've set up uh, boys and men uh, culturally to do this. So let's, you know, step one, let's take away, and I say, you know, white boys, but all boys, let's take away boys' permission to express a full range of human emotions. Right, all humans come into the world uh, with full emotional expression, and by around school age, around six or seven, uh, at least in the United States, we start to see uh, uh, boys and girls kind of diverge in what they're permitted uh, to express, and you know the rules about what they can and cannot express. I should pause here too to say and situate this in modern United States because this isn't the way the world's always been. Uh, throughout history, you know, we've seen gender norms uh, change. And even right now, if you took a snapshot, this isn't the way all uh, people are gendered in the world. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, cross-cultural variability. But we're talking about, uh, you know, kind of white masculinity in the U.S. Uh, so take away over time, early adolescence, middle, late adolescence, young adulthood, their full range of emotions. Uh, step two, while that's happening, marinate them in stories of and narratives where white men get all the goodies, right? and, and so they they do you know they they are growing up and seeing themselves uh, represented uh, incompletely uh, in history uh, in the stories, um, and then maybe coming to a point where they're looking around and they're like, I don't have these things. Uh, where are these things? And then you've got some someone in your ear, like you know, perhaps Will Ferrell, saying it's the feminists, or you know, blaming other people. You know, they're taking your things. Um, and then the third step is to trigger shame uh, without healthy ways to deal with it, uh, whether to learn from it uh, or whether to thrive as a result of recognizing it. Uh, and Brene Brown's done a lot of great work in this area, so um, you know, see all that stuff. Uh, but if you so one of the one of the most significant precursors to violence is the experience of shame. And so then reacting against that shame by you know, trying to reestablish some sense of power or, or, or masculinity. Uh, and, and what I'd like to see, uh, and particularly of, of white men who, who haven't had a, a lot of practice in vulnerability and, and emotional expression, is learn to manage and meet that shame in much healthier ways rather than to have to uh, rely on that reactive masculinity, right, to reestablish it through these. Uh, and whether they're doing it individually uh, through maybe interpersonal violence or they're doing it uh, on the systems level, right? So some of the resistance that uh, Jorg was talking about uh, to change in the system, you know, maybe leadership you know, in higher education. Um, so that, you know, that's what I want to at least set up those kind of, those three things. Something else I want to inter introduce you to that, I was taught in, in graduate school, I think it's probably been the most useful analogy for me clinically working with males. Uh, it's something called the male emotional funnel system that uh, Gandalf had, had written about in the in mid eighties. Uh, made the argument that uh, we all, so if you think about a funnel like this and we all come into the world, this is kind of like what I was talking about before with socialization. We come in the world uh, with a full you know, funnel full of emotions that we're allowed to um, express uh, or at least experience and express. Now think about some of the negative ones or that we would describe as negative, uh, shame, regret, um, failure, fear. Uh, these things that we don't uh, typically uh, in the United States allow boys and men to uh, express. 
through as they grow older at the bottom of that funnel, the only things that we allow or permit to, to slip out are things like maybe anger and aggression. It's not that we like it, uh, but we permit, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's quote unquote socially acceptable um, versus saying, wow, I'm, I'm feeling really vulnerable right now. I'm feeling really ashamed. So if you've got all these boys who are now, you know, uh, older uh, or young men, um, they've lost that ability to manage and navigate all those complex emotions and they're left with these very simple uh, reactive ones uh, like aggression and violence. Um, and again, I wanna remind, e even if it's not coming out as some type of physical interpersonal thing, violence still shows up in, in our systems uh, in, very cleverly in, in kind of other ways, you know, oppressing other people uh, when, we, when we try to make changes. Um, so I've been thinking too, like, you know, what do we do with this? Well, you know, we have to start really young, um, but we don't have to wait. Um, so you know, we don't have to put all the uh, onus on a, a caregiver or a parent or our, our school systems, although we should. Uh, we can also uh, do this work with our students, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our family members. All right, so this is one thing where it's never too late to start it. Uh, if that were true, I wouldn't have a job, uh, right? And, and so, you know, people are, uh, are capable of, of making conscious change. Um, but I want to, for that to occur, three, I guess I'm on a three kick. Three, three things have to be in place. And, and I want to uh, cite uh, Chris Kilmartin and Andrew Smiler. They wrote, a, they wrote a book called The Masculine Self. It's the, the book I use for my men of masculinities class. Use the analogy of a cell phone. So, um, these all come with default options, right? And so let's say um, in order for to change those three things have to occur. Um, so let's say I don't know how to use that do not disturb feature, which is a really handy one. Um, I have to have awareness of it. So I have to know that the option exists. So that's step one. I can't do anything with this thing unless I know that that default option uh, is available. So awareness that I can change it. Number two, I have to have motivation. Like I have to be motivated to change from the default. There's something that, you know, that's to be gained by me learning how to you know, redo this phone and, and change the settings. And then the third one is the ability and skill. So I, I, I have to know how to change from that default option. I have to know the things to press. Uh, and I want to encourage us to think about um, gender and so gender socialization, masculinities uh, in particular. If we expect more from our uh, boys and men, and I think we should, and we do, those three things have to be in place. So we have to be prepared to provide those things. You know, something like this, you know, ho hopefully is, you know, raises awareness about uh, you know, maleness and the intersection with white supremacy. Um, we also then have to increase people's motivation to say, okay, now that you know that it's there, uh, why bother changing? Like what's in it for you and all of us? Uh, and then that third one, we have to be able to, the, to support people in doing it. Here are the skills that, that we're gonna teach you in order to intervene in these systems uh, and, and support one another. And I, that's the, I, I'd argue that's probably one of the, the hardest parts is getting people to, to, to do that. Um, but I think that's what we're all here for. Uh, uh, that's what we're here for in our classrooms. That's what we're here for in our service work on campus in the community. Uh, and, and hopefully that's what you all are here for too, uh, is to kind of con continue this discussion and figure out how we can support each other uh, in changing some of these systems. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you all so much. I was, I you know, it's just amazing how much I think we can learn by coming into community and, and being able to um, to chat about what you all are doing on campus. And it's just so cool to uh, to listen to you all. So I'm going to have I have some more questions um, to, again, try to learn more, at least for myself. You know, one of the things and Ryan, you had talked about um, you talked about um, like, where, where do we go from here? What do we do? And um, and Dr. LaPlante, I was really kind of holding on to talking about like setting up positive role models, specifically like when discussing whiteness and masculinities. And so what I'm curious about is, you know, what can we do um, either as educators, as students um, about white supremacy and racism? Now, I know that this is, this is a big question and I don't think we're all, we're going to have like the answer to this, but I'm 
wondering if you all could share a little bit about you know what we can do about white supremacy and racism specific and specifically as like white folks as white men um, in this as well um, so I think what we'll I'll start with Dr. LaPlante you provided a little bit of that at the end and so I just want to explore that a little further yeah, thank you. I mean, that's a really great question. And, you know, I think obviously one of the first ways that we start to combat these things is by having events just like these um, and, you know, talking about the origins of, you know, attitudes or, or experiences that lead to radicalization. And I think making people aware of what those things are, um, you know, kind of as a you know, security measure, right? Like if you're experiencing this, it's okay, but let's not deal with it in an unhealthy way that leads to, you know, like radicalization or violence. So just being aware, like it's okay to feel like left out. It's okay to feel left behind. And whether that's socially or politically, um, just I think learning skills to, to deal with those emotions. And then on the other side of that, I mean, just education is so key, right? I mean, these are things that I discuss in my women in politics course and, you know, all of my political science classes is we need to learn, you know, um, like uh, Dr. Vanden said, so much of this is about helping people realize that it's not a zero sum game, you know, just because one group gets more of something or, you know, they, you know, get equality, um, that doesn't mean that there's less equality for you now. There's not a finite amount of equality um, that means if more groups have it, that means someone else has less. So you really have to like break down those narratives um, and, you know, help people understand that, um, you know, that there's not finite amounts of these resources. Um, and that way we can stop treating, um, you know, the, we can get rid of like the whole in-group, out-group, um, resentment. Um, and then, I mean, what's also just really critical, I kind of mentioned this a little bit in my introduction, but I mean, class consciousness is just so incredible. There's a variety of reasons why that never really took on in America. Capitalism certainly has a lot to do with it. Again, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but, you know, helping people understand like if they do feel marginalized and disadvantaged, where's the appropriate way to direct those feelings? Um, and how do we seek accountability? And a lot of that is, you know, through the government and the types of programs and things that our government um, institutes and the way that we redistribute resources and, and things of that nature. So, I mean, there's certainly tons of things that we can do in our classrooms to have these conversations and encourage people to speak up and share ideas. And I think that that's uh, one of the easiest ways that we can move forward as educators um, to start having these conversations. It's a really difficult question. Um, and there are many things that we could be doing um, to start. We could read, we could uh, listen to podcasts, we could watch YouTube videos like Dr. LaPlante was talking about earlier. We can discuss with one another, we can do professional development activities as students, we can uh, register for more, for more diversity coursework as institutions, we need to create more diversity coursework. We need to create diversity coursework in each major, even in majors where faculty say, what do we have to do with diversity? Those are the places that we need to require diversity coursework. In meetings, we need to ask the question, does this decision have anything to do with our implicit bias? Does this decision have anything to do with the way that we were raised as white people? This kind of disruption and talking uh, it take more time, but in the end, the decision is going to be more founded uh, and and less biased and uh, less oppressive and less discriminatory. Um, and then, what I always say to to students that I talk to, um, we we have to start with our personal sphere of influence. We always, especially as white men. We always underestimate how much influence we actually have on our parents, on our siblings, on our cousins, on our grandparents, on our extended families, on our friends, on our neighbors, on our uh, fraternity brothers, on our um, fellow athletes on a sports team. We have to begin in those kinds of circles to where, where we have an emotional connection, a loving connection, like Ryan was talking about earlier and Christina about the vulnerability where it is 
is important and and it likely is higher in those kinds of settings because we have always loved the, and been connected to these people. That's where I think we need to begin to have those conversations. That's just the start. I mean, how much time do we have? We could talk about this forever. So, um, but that's where I would start. Thanks. Uh, I think I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna build on that idea about you know starting with ourselves. The, Andrew, when you asked the question, I, I think the first thing that popped in my head was um, we have to figure out where we are situated in that system uh, personally, but then also, you know, kind of more, more broadly. Uh, it's hard work to do it. And if the idea is I'm one day going to like reach this stage where I figured it all out, you've already set yourself up for failure. Um, and so I, I think if we're going to show up if I'm going to show up as a as a white male and to, to try to challenge and disrupt this, I again I have to figure out where I'm at with it, um, and I have to I feel it's important to model um, my failures um, in it. And and because if I just show up and say and stay in my head and and say here's the things that I should do or we should or you should do as a student or or whomever, we're pretty good BS detectors. They're going to know that you know I, I don't think you've got it all figured out either. Uh, so I, I do think it's important to, uh, and maybe and I think we'll probably end up talking about that even here, um, recognizing our own place in it. I do want to challenge, I, I, I like the idea of uh, the systems level things not being zero sum, but I, I, I want to I want to share with you about a year ago, I, I kind of came to my own personal realization about zero sum. And for me, whiteness has shown up in zero in this zero sum argument. For a lot of my life, I grew up saying, well, let's just expand the pie, right? And then every, everybody benefits. But what I realized on a personal level, not a system level, on a personal level, uh, it is zero sum. I only have 24 hours in a day, just like everybody else does. I only have so much you know, money or resources right, right, to spend on things. So if I'm gonna be serious about changing systems, I have to look at where I put my resources. I can choose to uh, watch another episode of whatever thing I'm streaming, or I can choose to uh, you know, maybe watch a documentary or talk to somebody in my community about their experience with uh, housing discrimination. That is zero sum. I, I have to be willing to give up the things that are comfortable for me in order to learn uh, 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 from others or, or with others is probably a better way to put it. Same thing with my money. Uh, there, there was a really great book called um, Blind Spot, and they, you know, they're making this argument about oftentimes with people's charitable contributions, they, you know, you, you tend to give the places where people that look like you that are similar to you benefit from. And so if I go, so I went back to the zero something. It's like okay, if I'm donating to this cause, am I maybe in subtle ways continually support white supremacy or systems that benefit white people. Um, and so for me, I, I have to then say, maybe I'm not going to donate to them. And I'm going to shift my charitable contributions to an organization that's been historically and systemically underfunded or not funded. Um, and so I, I guess you now I'm just kind of babbling about it. I, I do think on, a, on an individual level, it is zero sum. And it requires a willingness to shift our resources of time uh, and uh, emotional investment and comfort uh, to, to spend more time uh, in, in discomfort and in, in, in seeing the value in doing that, uh, both learning about our own experience in these systems and the, and the harm that we've caused uh, in these systems, and then to, to, to build and support um, uh, people who have been marginalized in them. Thank you, everyone. And again, I mean, I think that's a, a question that we can continuously engage in, and I think is also like very dynamic and fluid. Um, you know, I've been thinking, Dr. McKellar, you talked about being able to know where we are. And I think folks will be very curious about, I think, our own personal journeys in, in social justice. And so I'm going to share a little bit of mine to maybe help us to like, talk, like be able to talk about this, about how I got to this point. And I also wanna share maybe a couple of pitfalls that I like fell into. And luckily enough in community, people were able to like help me get out. But, you know, I think um, it, it did start, it started my first year. Um, I went to Colorado State University, go Rams. I was also a history major. So it sounds like there's a lot of them 
out here. Um, but uh, it was it was my first year, and I had a uh, assistant hall director who suggested that I maybe apply to this like social justice retreat. And I can remember the part of the application had asked us, what's your definition of social justice? And truly that was probably the first time in my life I ever thought about that. And uh, because as a you know, white man living in Colorado Springs, Colorado in a predominantly white area went to a white high school, I never really had to think about any of uh, any of this. And so um, I remember I, I went onto Wikipedia and I copy and pasted the definition of social justice that they had there. And somehow they let me in and thank goodness, you know, and I think it started this journey around social justice um, for me. But like there was a, like a ton of other things I was thinking as you all were talking about like, oh, you know, you should read and engage in text. And what I would recommend is also reading um, like having some direction to that. There's some good idea, like there's some good books that you could read. I, for whatever reason, thought that um, like someone had suggested to me, maybe in my vulnerable state, that I should read Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And uh, I remember so, sort of reading that, right? And being like, oh my gosh, this has the answers to all of this. And, um, you know, and on all, of, you know, personal liberty and like individual, like just our own worth is gonna bring us this way, right? And that was really appealing to me. And I'm very grateful that I brought that. I had a community of people I could bring that to. And I remember talking about it and I had people who engaged in some dialogue with me and maybe helped me see some of the, the holes in that and some of the pieces that I really needed to, examine like where where did I have this idea about what personal liberty meant um, and who was that benefiting and why so why was it so attractive to me and not other folks right because that's a narrative that fits in with me that I think uh, Dr. McCullough you were talking about it's all of the stories that I either see myself as the hero or the villain and very rarely a, one of the side characters you know like and that's how my I always operate. The other thing I wanted to mention before we get started, hopefully this gives enough time for your all's own reflection too, is that, you know, I think also as a, as a gay white man, one of the pitfalls I also fell into is not thinking that I needed to, to interrogate my own whiteness and my own maleness because I had a, like, a marginalized identity that I was really focusing on. And I didn't see initially the ways in which that was also harmful in my own communities and in, in the LGBT community and how uh, white men can be pretty harmful in that community as well. And how um, we have uh, oftentimes uh, replaced without any recognition, the experience, the work and the history of queer trans people of color. Um, and, you know, and we now have replaced them and also are overrepresented in leadership positions. It's, uh, I know something in, here at, uh, in La Crosse, um, are the center uh, downtown is mostly white folks that are running that, you know, and I think that's a conversation that we engage in pretty regularly is how like we are overrepresented there as well and in those spaces. And that is a function of white male supremacy that um, shows up in other marginalized communities as well. And so um, I think it's trying to lean into the discomfort of still seeing myself as a white man um, and that like, I don't get a pass uh, because I have a, another marginalized identity there. All right, up next, Dr. Vianden. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I think the first thing to say about this journey that, that uh, we started on is that it is never complete. Um, uh, there, there are many times near daily as, as my colleagues in SAA know, um, that I that I mess up badly sometimes with the stuff that I say, with the way that I show up, with the things that I do or not do. It's it's constant, um, and I, I'm not trying to say that as an excuse, but I think that sort of being a work in progress means that I am continuing to be on this journey, right? So that that's to start with. And I think Ryan sort of started talking about this earlier. For me, this journey started back home. I'm not from here. You know, a name like mine uh, is weird for sure. Uh, and uh, I'm originally from Germany and I spent 22 years living there. Uh, and I grew up in the capital of 
West Germany. So I was uh, surrounded by friends and kids whose parents were originally not from Germany, right? So they spoke different languages, they looked differently, um, they ate different food, they, they, they were completely different uh, than sort of your regular sort of white uh, German. And so I sort of got this idea that that's how life ought to be and was. Uh, and then coming over here uh, in the mid 90s, we had lots of different discussions around diversity that were very dissimilar from, from what I had grown up with. Um, and that, that sort of continued to spark my interest uh, in this topic um, and sort of com committing to that. Uh, there are, I mean, if you, you know, if you would ever read the book, even if you don't, I can just tell you all, I mean, not today it would take too long, but in the book, I'm describing stuff where I screwed up uh, royally many times, and it's not that long ago. And so part of this journey for me is also that we as white men, and I say this in all the talks that I give, is that we have this tendency, you know, I think Christina was talking about social justice warriors earlier, that we have this sort of tendency to think that once we uh, reach this level of wokeness, that we as white people are then better than all the white people that are still not at that kind of level, right? And so we begin to disassociate uh, or, or sort of unhinge from them. And we say stuff like, I can't do anything with them anymore. They won't listen to me. They, the they is you 10 years ago, five years ago, yesterday, 20 years ago, right? And so the they needs to continue to be engaged because it, you're engaging you. Uh, and, and I think that that's important for me as part of this journey as well. Boy, that's a long-winded roundabout way to get to nowhere, but that's what a journey is, right? So. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a question that re requires a lot of self-reflection, right? I mean, what do we mean by social justice and what does it mean to be a part of that? And, you know, to me, it kind of just means like literally treating everyone on the planet with respect and doing what you can to ensure that, you know, we have a quality of outcome, equity in our society. And growing up in Valdosta, Georgia, um, you know, down in the deep south, um, spending, you know, most of my formative years there, um, spending graduate school in Atlanta, Georgia, um, you know, I witnessed a lot of really horrific racism growing up in a state like that. Um, just didn't ever really make any sense to me how so much hate could exist for other people not even knowing these people, you know, growing up as a woman in the South and constantly being told that like, just because of my gender, like I'm not as competent, um, you know, for, for no good reason, right? I, I, um, I was a high performance automotive mechanic in high school. I built my first V8 engine when I was 13 years old and it never ceased to amaze me, you know, in high school when customers would come into the shop and they'd see, I, I need a new water pump, man. And I'm like, all right, they can model in year. And they're like, no, honey, I need someone who can help me. You know, I'm just kind of spending so much time growing up with stuff like that. Um, you know, you, you just feel like a responsibility, right? To want to create a world where stuff like that doesn't exist. So I could go on and on, but, you know, I think we, even without really realizing it, I mean, for years, I didn't classify myself as a feminist because I was like, they're radical and they're crazy and they hate men, right? Like all those classical uh, stereotypes about what feminism is. And, you know, I internalized those things and, you know, without really realizing it and kind of denouncing it to, to an extent, it was things that I was passionate about and things that I wanted to change. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess just personal experiences, right, made me passionate about these issues and want to contribute to conversations to change the way that we think about other people. Um, and regarding the pitfall question, that's so important. And I think we need to, there's so many great points have already been brought up. Um, and I think one of mine that I was certainly guilty of um, and I try to be very aware of and to, to not commit is um, you know, centering the conversation on yourself when you're uh, interacting or communicating with somebody and you're, you're learning about ways, you know, that you know, they might have felt uh, discriminated against or, you know, someone's just telling you 
about their story um, and automatically saying, like trying to be empathetic, right? Oh yeah, I totally understand. I Something really similar happened to me and it's like, it really didn't. And while you're trying to sympathize with that individual and like create that connection, right? Um, sometimes it's best to just be quiet and to just listen. Um, and be mindful of the experience that someone else is sharing with you without trying to immediately, you know, interrupt or interject and say, I understand it happened to me because all of our experiences are so, so different. Um, and so, you know, if these issues are something that you're passionate about and you want to be more mindful of other people's experiences and come to a better understanding, but that's certainly some advice that I would give you to just be mindful of where you are putting yourself in the space of someone else sharing a very vulnerable moment. And I think when we can pay a little bit more attention to listening to one another, I mean, that's, that's where progress is born. I, I think if I was gonna plot out my awareness, I, and I don't say this in like this witty self-deprecating way, I'm probably a toddler. Like, I, I think I'm at that phase right now. Um, God. It seems like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't remember talking about this stuff in middle school, high school, barely even in college. I think it probably wasn't until graduate school, really. But I'm going to share something. So I, uh, it, well, two, two failures of mine. I lived in Chicago after undergrad for a few years, uh, working in a, in a different field. Um, so there was one night, so the company I worked for out of college closed down within like months after starting there. So I had almost no money too proud to ask for help. Uh, and, and one night I was, by, but I still met my friends out at the, at, at the bars and I had no money to take the uh, L home or, or a cab. So I decided to walk four miles. Well, I lived West Loop. And if you know anything about Chicago, I, had, I was on the kind of the North end of the city. So I walked through Cabrini Green. Cabrini Green was another failed housing project uh, that the city of Chicago had done over many years. It was in the middle of being kind of gentrified. And so some of it had been torn down, but much of it hadn't. It was still a, a, a rough neighborhood. Totally clueless, ignorant me, entitled asshole white guy, three in the morning, walking drunk through Cabrini Green. Uh, I had no business being there. And uh, one of the neighbors uh, in the neighborhood came up to me. He was an older black man, probably in his early 50s. And he, he looks at me, he says, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm just walking home. He's like, he's like that's stupid. He's like, you can't be doing that, right? You know, looking like this at, at this time of night. He's like, I'll tell you what, I'm going to walk with you. I'll walk with you all the way through. I'll get you to the, you know, to the uh, outside of the neighborhood. Uh, and then you can go on your way. When that happened, I didn't think anything of it. Like, other than, wow, this is this really nice guy. It wasn't until years later, I was like, what privilege I had as a white person walking into a neighborhood that it, at night and having uh, somebody who has been uh, discriminated against in that neighborhood systematically for a long time go out of his way to protect me. And I'd ask myself, would I have done that same thing for a person of color at that age? And my answer is probably not. I wouldn't have had the guts to put myself out there and, and, and step up and, and jump. And I, I've had so many instances like that where I was kind of like cluelessly moving through the world and, and you know, where doors are opening and I never questioned you know, why they might be doing so. Ironically, I was even in, and, and part, of the pro, part of the problem for me was that I uh, lived outside of Detroit. I, I, I've been an ethnic or a, a racial minority in schools and in neighborhoods, but even, this, even the neighborhood I was living in there, it was predominantly African-American, but I chose to live there because the real estate was cheaper. I got a much bigger place there than had I lived on the north side of the city. And so I, in odd ways was still benefiting you know, from privilege by making this choice, right? And, but it also made me clueless to say, well, this isn't an issue because I, you know, I, I'm around diversity. And it probably wasn't until I was in graduate school doing, when I started doing clinical work, when I started to hear individuals' stories of being on the receiving end of bias, discrimination, prejudice, marginalization, and whether it was you know sexual orientation, race, gender, it didn't matter what it was. It, it took me having to experience that person, uh, you know, at that level to be like, whoa, like I, I, I really didn't truly understand what this is like and what role I've 
played in it. Um, and I've had a lot of really amazing clients over the years that were, you know, willing to bring that up in therapy, uh, you know, and kind of take that risk and, and challenge, you know, me as a male or challenge me as a white person uh, and, and how I fit into that system. Um, and then, but even then it was still kind of, it was cognitive for me. It, I don't think it really was probably till I was at UWL and I was on the um, hate response team and started to hear the stories of our students on campus and in the community of their experiences and to learn from my colleagues, you know, staff members in, uh, in many different offices, student life and OMSS. Um, like I had to get, I had to, I, I had to get schooled in, in how to do this work, how to have these conversations, how to listen, uh, as Christina had mentioned, uh, and that's why I say, like I'm, I, I feel like I'm just learning to to look at this stuff. Um, even then, it was mostly the individual. It's only been the last couple of years where I've really been uh, challenged to to think a little bit more broadly at that systems level. So I got a long way to go. Thanks, everyone. I'm I'm sitting here reflecting, you know, we're a past an hour of time that we've been in our discussion. And I I have like all of these questions that I have written down and that we have in our document. And so um, but also looking to um, sort of wrap this up, also knowing that this isn't where the discussion ends. And so um, so I think the last question that I have for us and what I'm hoping you all are able to, to share is that. If you could provide, I was actually going to come up with like a thing of threes, um, but I decided not to. So I only have two questions in this one. But, um, you know, if you were to, to summarize, what is one takeaway that you'd like the audience to leave with today? But also in like an effort to recognize the continuing of this conversation is what is one reflection prompt or question that you'd like folks to, to really be thinking about moving forward into the next um, even like the end of the semester or wherever that might be. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll start, I think a, a takeaway for me, and even in th this experience of getting um, this set up and um, us engaging in these conversations is being able to find community of folks that are willing and wanting to have these conversations, you know, and knowing that for me, the, I, I think almost everybody mentioned the work's never done. Um, you know, and I feel like just like I've learned so much and I know there are times where I can easily think, okay, I've gotten this, I've, I know all of this. And then, you know, I think I, trying to remain like humble in, in what I don't know um, is always really, I think an exciting part too. Um, and I think my reflection question or, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping folks can think about afterwards is um, actually something that Dr. Vianden had talked about, but like, uh, maybe what is that one person that like one white person, that one white man that like you're, you've sort of like said, oh, it's, they're a they, um, right? There's someone else other than us necessarily. Um, and, you know, I, I think of that, like, um, I think of people that I'm close with, people that I went to high school with, maybe that like I can relate into and remember, maybe when I was near, maybe not necessarily like the, the thinking that they're, at now but can remember maybe that point of being like uh, I think Dr. LaPlante talks like being vulnerable and I could go either way right and like and leaning into that uh, where I was there you know and being able to see like gosh what are some things what are some questions I might be able to ask this person when they're talking about Atlas Shrugged and personal liberty and all of this sort of stuff and what were questions that were useful for me to think about and that maybe created some like dissonance and, and conflict that I could think about. Um, so again, thinking about that person and, and how might you be able to engage in them using empathy and like relating back to maybe a personal experience of yours. Dr. McKelly. Yeah. All right. So one, one takeaway, I think it's another key to the system staying in place. Uh, and, and so the, the takeaway is to expect more from people I think I've been in this place where I got a lot of reinforcement for being the quote unquote, like good white guy, right? Um, and it can be very easy to say, pat yourself on the back, pat myself on the back and say, okay, I've, I've, I've done it. You know, I've done the work. They see me as the good person. Uh, that is the bare minimum. I mean, that, that should be the starting point. 
Uh, and it should, the question should always be, what else do you got? Um, and, and, ex, and continue to expect more uh, because that's not a great role for any of us to be in. Uh, I, I guess I want to say there, there's no such thing as, you know, patting ourselves on the back and say, you know, I'm one of the good ones. Um, it really should be in what's next and what else can I do? Uh, so think about where you might be in that or, or others in, in your in your community. Um, a prompt or reflection, uh, I, I did I did come prepared with a quote that I end most of my masculinities discussions on. So uh, this, these are Collings words. Uh, uh, it was a forward in a book on masculinity and, and this was a challenge for uh, men in the 21st century. So I'm just gonna read the quote and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so challenging uh, men to be strong without hardness, soft without fear, powerful without oppression, gentle without shame, knowledgeable without arrogance, nurturing, led with humility and themselves with joy. That's really tough to follow. Um, I, I think my takeaway goes into the direction of, of, of vulnerability. Um, and that is learn to listen, unlearn to speak or to want to speak or dominate. Right? Learn to follow, uh, don't feel a need to lead. Um, strive to be an accomplice, a listener, um, someone who has empathy without doing what uh, Christina talked about earlier was like, oh yeah, I know what you're going through. This is what happened to me. Just stop at, you want to listen, uh, you want to be empathic. Um, and the question that's also difficult, yeah, what I would love to think about is the ways in which we as white men on college campuses, specifically students, can begin to think about how to identify with folks that are of similar social standing, whether that's um, economic standing or whether that's sort of salient identity of student or college student, rather than to think about wanting to be like sort of white men elites who may not have our, our best interest at heart anyway, right? And so the question might be, how do I begin to identify with folks that are more like me than the folks that my family or my parents or my teachers have identified with that are not on the same sort of rungs of the ladder, if that, if that makes any sense. So it's this idea of identification and who do we identify with? Who do we befriend? Who do we become close with? Um, who, who are vastly different from us? Uh, men can do that, white men can do that, but it's not how we've been socialized. So that, that might be my question. Okay, yeah, uh, those are all really tough to follow, so I will do my best. Um, and I think this is the main takeaway, as so many people here have pointed out this evening, is that, you know, there is so much work left to do, and no one is expecting you to have it all figured out and to understand, like, these are fundamentally the things that make people racist, and if we just do the opposite of that, problem solved. You know, these are the things that make people misogynist, you know, like it's obviously so much more complicated than that. Um, and so what I really want the, the audience to take away from this event is that there is so much more work to do. Um, and the best place for starting out is just to think about these things. Think about these questions. Think about where you fit in, you, your family, your friends fit into these conversations and have those conversations. Um, and that's, you know, exponentially better than doing nothing or just being sad or being mad about it. So, you know, challenge yourself to, to think about these things actively. Um, and instead of a, I guess that kind of goes into my um, reflection. Um, it's more of a challenge that I have. I guess I'll leave you with a challenge, some homework to do. And obviously you don't have to do this if it makes you uncomfortable, um, but I would challenge you to maybe have a conversation with someone, a friend, 
family member um, about a topic that might be kind of traditionally difficult to talk, talk about. And again, you know, it doesn't have to be anything, um, you know, really emotional or sensitive, obviously take care of yourself. And, you know, I'm not telling you to completely change your family's ideology overnight, but do what's comfortable to you and challenge yourself to start having these type of conversations. And you know, maybe it's a Twitter conversation. Uh, you see someone raise a point that you just don't understand. And your your initial reaction might just be so angry. I can't believe somebody would feel that way. Um, and start on a conversation. Yeah, I actually do this a lot. It's like a really sick habit or hobby of mine. I like challenging people on Twitter in a very respectful way, you know. Can you explain to me why you feel this way? And I'm so not being pretentious. I literally would like you to share these things with me. And the conversation always begins very hostile. And then it's like, you know, I have to remind the individual I'm speaking with, I hear you, like, that makes sense. But this is what I feel when you say that. And, you know, after like the sixth or seventh iteration, things start calming down. But I have learned so much from people who, I would have otherwise just outright dismissed because you know you see the post right and you're like that's crazy like that person doesn't know anything um and again so i, I would challenge you guys to do that if it makes you comfortable um again you know taking care of yourself is the most important thing i know that some of these can be really um sensitive issues um but yeah i mean try to broaden your horizons you know take a step in some you know someone else's um shoes for a minute, see how it feels. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. LaPlante, McKelly, Viandin. Um, I'd also like to thank folks that were involved in helping us set this up. Um, we're very fortunate here at UWL to have many people that are engaging in these conversations. So um, please keep an eye out uh, on the Voices of Uprising page, has some great information, has the last, um, the first Voices of Uprising uh, video, as well as some discussion questions, places to read about anti-racism um, uh, or things to read about that, as well as other links um, to do that. And we'll hopefully be adding and continuing to add there. You can also go to the Voices of Uprising page and there's a link if you wanted to um, suggest other topics for us to explore and discuss in the future as well. Thank you all so much for joining us today and um, I hope you have a good rest of your semester.